Thank you, Maddie. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for Ask a Legislator with Delegate Lisa Zukov. I'm Kelly Kaysman, the Executive Director of Think Kids. We're going to spend the next hour talking to Delegate Zukov, who represents the 4th District of West Virginia, mostly Marshall County and some of Ohio County. Um, we'll check our Facebook page a few times during the conversation, so type any questions below and we'll get to them as the conversation progresses. And many thanks again to our wonderful intern, Maddie Lavoy, who is watching our, our Facebook feed and will be sharing your questions and comments with us. At the bottom of the hour, we'll be joined by Mr. Sean Decker, a teacher at Central Catholic High School in Wheeling and his social studies class. And we'll talk with them for about 20 minutes uh, they'll be asking Delegate Zukov questions as well, which is something that we're really looking forward to. And if it works out, it's something that we'll incorporate in future events. So welcome, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for um, agreeing to be our, our first delegate uh, in, in this segment. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit about your biography from the West Virginia Legislators Legislature website and ask a few questions about you before we dig into the questions about the legislature and the legislative session coming up. Okay, thank you. So Delegate Zukov has been serving the fourth district in the West Virginia House of Delegates since 2018 and has recently been named Assistant Minority Whip. She's a business owner, received her bachelor's degree in political science from West Virginia University and works with a number of organizations in her district, uh, some that we know, including the Marshall County Family Resource Network, the Marshall County Childhood Cancer Awareness Group, and the Ohio County Democrat Women's Club. Uh, so uh, Delegate Zukov, what made you decide to run for office? Well, it, I was getting pretty disenfranchised from the process in Charleston and feeling like um, perhaps um, regular folks um, weren't being heard or their issues weren't being um, dealt with, especially children's issues. That's really important to me. I have two daughters of my own, one who lives here and one who doesn't, they're adults. And I have two grandchildren. And um, I was really concerned about some of the things that were happening, um, the way that education was being uh, seemingly attacked in West Virginia, and um, some newer issues that were coming to light that we re really weren't really dealing with um, children's issues perhaps the way we could, and especially our foster care crisis in West Virginia. We know that we, um, we have a long way to go to really do the best we can by those children. So that's the main reason that I became involved and decided to run for office. Well, great. So, you know, we always like hearing that uh, issues are a priority for you. So they were actually a motivator for you to run for office. Absolutely. That's awesome. So you were, uh, your first session, was it in 2018 or 2019? It was 2019. Thanks. Yes. Uh, so what did you expect going in? Well, I was, um, I thought I knew a lot about the process, especially since I have a political science degree, but um, in, in all fairness, I'm 58, so it's been a long time since I've been in college, but I've always been interested in keeping involved and in, in understanding the political process, but I um, was, uh, I was thinking that um, it would be a lot easier than it actually is. And when I got to the legislature, you know, I didn't really know much about how to write a bill. Um, I knew what state code was, but I didn't know how do you amend that? How do you change it? How, do you, how does the legislature work? They really don't like to open one part of a code if it's not already open for another bill. Um, so there are a lot of little intricacies to learn. Um, obviously relationships I think have a huge part of being an effective legislator, but I think that's an important part of life in period. You know, um, I've often heard people don't, don't care who you are until they know how you care about them. So I think, you know, being open, understanding that while we may have different, think about things completely different um, from the political 
process perspective from Republican, Democrat, Independent, we are all still people. And, you know, while my idea of uh, helping children might be a little different than someone on the other side of the aisle, we both still have children's best interests at heart. And how can we talk about it in a way that we can both wrap our arms around it and get to the bottom line? And I think we saw that with the bill last year that um, was changed, the all-encompassing bill around foster care legislation. Um, so just to give you an example. Yeah, yeah, we say that often. People love their kids, right? People, people love exactly. Out of the aisle you're on. Uh, was was your first session like you anticipated? Um, well, we had a teacher strike, so um, <laughs> that was interesting. And um, and I'd been down to the one the year before, and all my daughter's a teacher. Um, she's a special education teacher, and so you know I have a real understanding of that of the the education process. And when I became semi-retired um, about eight years ago, I decided that I was going to be a teacher in my pre-retirement years. And I went to Wheeling Jesuit University to be certified to become a teacher. Did my student teaching and very quickly learned that while I love the kids and the teaching. Um, at my age at that time, I just wasn't into all the bureaucracy and all the paperwork and things. I just thought um, from my perspective, I would rather be with the kids and teaching. So I determined and God bless the teachers because I have a lot of respect for them and what they do every day. Um, so I do have a pretty good background. I understand, you know, a lot of the educational concepts and terms because I've been educated in that area. But um, it was really interesting to see um, all of those folks come to Charleston to um, have meetings back home. You know, when we knew that there was going to be a strike, we held a town hall meeting in Moundsville and invited local ed legislators from lo local educators from our district to come and speak to us on the weekend when we were home. And let us know what their real thoughts were and how it was impacting our community. And um, to me, it was the legislative process in action. You know, everyone, I wish everyone could be involved as involved as those teachers were when it's something that they care about. Um, I think it's important while we seem like Charleston's three hours away and it seems like, you know, that the process is far removed. I can tell you, I speak with somebody on the phone almost every day about an issue that the state that impacts our constituents, um, especially during the pandemic. There's been, I've been getting a lot of calls about you know, the shots and, and um, unemployment with the pandemic has been um, horrific. And we have some main, um, some issues with our workforce, West Virginia folks. They work really hard, don't get me wrong, but they've just been inundated with claims. And so if folks can't get through on the phone or they're having glitches te technologically, then I can help them work through this process. So I think that I wish people were more involved all the time rather than when it's just an issue that they have. Right, you know, I'm hoping that if there's, you know, we talk about the little silver linings of the pandemic, and I'm hoping that perhaps it will change the way people advocate during legislative session, perhaps out of legislative session, because we kind of fell into this formula of everybody show up on your awareness day and then yes. try and with your legislator. And how, how effective do you think that is? Well, I mean, we have, you have our ear while you're there. But we have committee meetings to attend. We have the session to attend. I would much rather um, have you call me when we're not in the legislature beforehand. Now, this year's election years are a little different, but, you know, and we're starting a little later this year because it was an election year. So you've got, you know, like three months that you could call us if there's an issue that you're really concerned about. Um, and it's really helpful to us to know what those issues are ahead of time. If there's a bill that needs written, um, if there is, you know, somebody we need to see that we can see in person before we get really busy in the second half of the legislative session. So I I would encourage folks to always stay in touch if you have a concern or issue. Great. Yeah. So um, during the um, legislative sessions in which you've been a part, what would you consider your best moment? 
Well, my best moment was definitely getting the um, the ACES legislation bill passed last year. Uh, that was the first bill and only bill I've ever gotten passed. So while I've had other bills and been a part of other bills, I was actually the main sponsor and worked very closely with you and um, the ACES coalition members in West Virginia to make that a reality. Um, and unfortunately, because of the pandemic, that bill wasn't able to move forward, but we are um, reconfiguring the bill now now um, to take the pandemic into consideration. We still think that that bill, which will allow um, the medical folks across the country, around across the state to come up with an agreed upon protocol to help children um, that have adverse childhood experiences, to help them recognize what those are and to help um, nurses, whoever they might come in contact with, um, their guidance counselors, their, their pediatrician, their general practitioner, whoever they may be coming up with um, is, is important. And the book that you have up now called The Deepest Well by Nadine Burke Harris is the, is the book that changed everything for me. Um, I was given this book by um, Kathy Safran when she was up here with um, Florence Crittenden. And I read this book and it was life changing for me. Um, you, it's very interesting to understand what adverse childhood experiences are. If you're listening and you have, you've got some time during the pandemic, buy this book. If, if I had my druthers, I would have make it recommended reading for everyone in the legislature. Um, and I have bought many of these books and given them out in the legislature. So folks that I thought needed to know this, um, it's really important. But it's 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 adverse childhood experiences. And um, Kelly, you could probably explain it better than I do. But the things that happen to us young during our, our young life can impact our health and well being for the rest of our lives. And it's fairly new. Um, a, fairly new study when you think about medical um, medical studies. And um, Nadine Burke Harris actually was the leader of this pro of finding this information by starting a clinic in a low income neighborhood in, in um, California. When it dawned on her that these children that were having these adverse experiences were also um, having issues like asthma and um, chronic conditions. And this really follows us for the rest of our life if it's not dealt with properly. And so in the long run, it will save the state a lot of money. Obviously, that's not why I'm doing it or why I have a concern. But when you think about dealing with it from a state perspective medically, helping children um, deal with these issues um, while they're young and helping them understand that can really lead to a better life. A, a life that has less chronic disease, which in turn is a lot less expensive for the state. So not only is it good practice because we care about our children, but it's good practice because it makes their life better and they're gonna have a lot of, a lot less health, less health issues down the road. And we should all care about that, you know? So, um, and do you have anything to add, Kelly? You're the ACES expert. Um, well, I'm not an expert, but I know a lot. <laughs> And uh, we, because we've been talking about this a lot in um, the advocacy around kids health issues in our state, because many of the problems that we have that kids are experiencing right now can be tracked, uh, you know, traced back to poverty and adverse childhood experience. Mm -hmm. And if we would start there, rather than trying to say, you know, how do we deal with uh, the influx of kids into our foster care system? How do we deal with the burden of more kids removed um, from the homes due to the drug crisis? Um, if we would start upstream, which a lot of people have been saying for years, if we would start there and trying to nip things in the bud, get the kids services they need on the onset, then we could be raising uh, you know, more uh, adapted, thriving adults. But but convincing legislators that you know that investment will yield the the appropriate dividends is not always easy. Yes, yes. So um, even though that's that was my greatest legislative victory and, and something I'm very proud of, we didn't anticipate the pandemic. So we're going to start back again. We're reintroducing the bill. We're going to extend the timelines that we had in place because obviously the pandemic's not going to be finished at the end of the legislative session. So we're trying to be um, provide a more realistic um, 
a more realistic timeline. And um, we had a little bit of opposition in the legislature and we changed some wording in the bill from a shall, the state shall do this to the state may do this. And um, I'm gonna put the language back to a shall. Um, and see where we go from there, because you should always try your best with what you believe in, I think. So um, we're going to do that. But I, I also think that as we speak about the reasons that our children need to get back to school during the pandemic, and that's all over the news right now, we know that children are not doing as well, not only learning, but thriving because of the social isolation that we're going through with this pandemic. Um, we are seeing a lot of mental health issues, um, not just in small children, but in our college, our college age children. And, and these ACEs learning how to deal with these issues effectively, mindfulness training, um, just that's just one area. Um, we also have a, a bill that I tried to get passed last year that I'm reintroducing is trauma-informed schools so that everyone that's in the school system from the bus driver to the, the school cook to the teacher to the principal to the superintendent of schools are trained on adverse childhood experiences and they know how to help children deal with that. So wherever the child feels most comfortable and they come in contact with those folks with, that they're going to see every day within the school system, They'll be they'll, those folks will be trained to recognize issues and how to help those children or how to um, at least forward those concerns to another person who might be able to help them. Um, so I'm excited about that as well. I'm pretty passionate about children, as you can tell. Yeah. And, and we're very thankful. Um, Maddie, do we have any questions on the Facebook feed? No questions so far, Kelly. Okay, great, thank you. So let's ask you, uh, Delegate Zukov, what have you found to be the greatest challenges? I think the greatest challenges, and I think that we're going to be dealing with that, um, when you're in the minority, it's always difficult to overcome um, those issues. And again, that goes back to building relationships. Um, when we dealt with the foster care bill uh, last year, I was very fortunate because I was in a working group meeting um, that was held on a Sunday and I was invited with another delegate um, to come and help meet with the Republicans with the Senate to try to hash out the deal with the, um, with, uh, the Senate on funding the um, foster care bill. So I think that if you you need to develop your expertise so that folks, uh, I think, respect your knowledge and where you're coming from. I think that's critical. So no matter what party you're in, it's important that you do your homework and that you know your, you know what you're talking about. But also having those relationships where someone doesn't think, oh, there's Lisa Zukoff, Democrat. Hey, there's Lisa Zukoff, delegate who cares about children. And she makes a lot of good points. Maybe we should ask her to be involved. So I think that's, that's, it's a hindrance, but I think it's something that can be overcome if you recognize that. I feel as if you were successful in your, uh, in the bill that hasn't been implemented due to COVID, um, the ACES bill, as we called it, because you, um, you know, you brought your copies of the book, right? <laughs> and, and you talked early and you talked often. And I think that people really respected that it was something that you believed in and you were passionate about. Mm -hmm. And well, thank so, you. Yeah, you weren't coming at it from from you know people didn't think you had a, or, or, uh, ulterior motives or right. You know, um, it, and so I think that that was successful. But you know, we we've really reached such a hyper partisan place in our society that um, I, I think that your job is probably going to become harder. Yes, and I think that's going to be the hardest part of it this year is overcoming that. Um, um, so thank you for asking about that. And, you know, some of that is already reaching across the aisle, our first day of session a couple weeks ago, and being in touch with colleagues on the telephone beforehand to say, hey, we want to work on these issues, and um, how can we do this together? And so reaching out, um, because if you just wait, you're going to be left behind. Right, right. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some bills that you've championed, but weren't as successful. And I'm thinking... Uh, and there may have been other bills, but I'm thinking about the trauma-informed schools bill. Right. Well, we brought, I was on the education committee last, the last legislature, and we actually have, again, with Florence Crittman, a very successful trauma-informed schools um, program in Ohio County um, 
and they have made, and they're also documenting the program. So it's been studied, it's been published, um, it's being done in the correct manner so that they can actually show the progress that's been made. They're, you know, they're, they're um, pre-test, post-test, um, talking to the kids and the, and the educators that are involved ahead of time. And it's, they've made huge inroads with those children. Um, and so we had them come and talk about the talk before it, before the legislature. We got it through the education committee in a bipartisan fashion. Um, and if I have a bill, I'm always rare, very cognizant of, I need folks from both sides of the aisle to be on that bill. I, you know, for the ACES bill, I have all three educators, all three physicians from the legislature that are physicians on as co-sponsors of that bill, because they understood the medical uh, the medical necessity for it. And, and so you kind of think strategically about, you know, who needs to be on this? And, and, and so that's part of it, you know, who needs to be on this? And, and what do they care about? And how can they help me get this passed? But um, trauma informed schools, we got through the first committee, but we couldn't get it through finance. Um, and we do have folks like the teachers union, AFT was willing to come to the table. They've been doing that as part of their um, training already, doing, um, doing uh, some training for um, ACES training for the kids that are the teachers that are in school. So we had some um, nonprofit groups that were coming to the table that said, look, we can do this with a very little money because money is always a factor. If it's gonna cost money in the legislature, it's gotta be put in the budget and that's problematic. So um, I think that was, the, the money was the biggest issue. We couldn't get past that hurdle. But I also need any listeners out there to know that um, it's very rare for a bill to get through the legislature in one, in one year. So our ACES bill was kind of a miracle in itself, but we had a lot of help from the ACES coalition members, Kelly taking the lead on that. Um, they also helped with the, you know, doing their footwork, meeting with different legislators, um, making it known that they were, you know, the nurses groups were behind the bill. Um, the pediatricians were behind the bill. Uh, so, you know, helping folks help to do your homework. But um, so I think those are some of the important issues to have but but that that you know again um i was new and just learning that was my first session my first legislation legislature so my first time of service in the legislature so i've learned a lot from that um that bill is going to be reintroduced as well so another bill that i had that didn't have to do with schooling and i don't like to be um, misconstrued as a taxation bill but West Virginia has been very fortunate with the natural gas and oil industry over the last 10 years in our community. And we have a lot of out of state landowners that own the property that have, get royalties from those from the oil and gas industry. Other states, um, Pennsylvania being one, um, when the royalty checks are written, you know, West Virginians, we have to file West Virginia state tax returns. So they automatically have to pay the taxes on the royalties that are received. Well, they're with those out of state landowners, it's not that simple. They would have to file their West Virginia taxes in order to pay those funds. And our tax department doesn't have the manpower or the time to go out and look for those folks. So this bill would simply require that the gas companies who are paying out the royalties pay the West Virginia Virginia state taxes to the state tax department. So we're not taxing anybody on something that they shouldn't already be paying. And frankly, West Virginians are paying it on our land in West Virginia. So why shouldn't out-of-state landowners pay it? Um, so we had a little bit of pushback. We got it through the energy um, committee. Again, couldn't get into the finance committee. But um, interestingly enough, this morning I got a call from the energy committee asking me if I was going to put forth that bill again. So I'm more hopeful this time, but um, that was another bill that I thought because it's just, it's a no brainer to me. West, um, Pennsylvania over the last three years has brought in millions of dollars that they didn't have into, ta into state revenue simply by getting the revenue that was, that they, that they deserved and it was in their tax, um, in their tax code anyway. So. That sounds like a great bill. Tell, tell us your dog's name. Um, I have well, I have four dogs, but three of them are home. I have, and I apologize ahead of time if they start barking. I told Kelly, the UPS man's already been in the neighborhood, so hopefully it will be okay. And the male lady's been here. But I have two yellow labs. I have Murphy and Gracie. And then I have a um, half golden retriever, half Newfoundland named Griffin. 
So he's, he's a mixed breed dog. And we have a great Pyrenees who is our greeter at our business. My husband takes him to work every day. Oh, wow. He has some separation anxiety issues. <laughs> That's so cute. How big is he? He's a hundred pounds. Yes. And interestingly, so we're talking about my legislative experience. One of my campaign flyers, my campaign um, cards that went out was a picture of me with Finn that said she can run with the big dogs in Charleston. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because who doesn't love dogs, right? Who doesn't? I don't yeah. trust people who don't love dogs, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, Maddie, before we switch it over to Sean, um, are there any questions or comments you want to share on the Facebook feed? Um, yes, we have a couple questions, actually. Um, one, how do you get involved with the ACES West Virginia Coalition? Well, that's probably a pretty good question for Kelly, but there is an ACES Coalition Facebook page and there's an ACES Coalition um, um, website as well. So if you just go out and type West Virginia ACES Coalition, Google it or whatever your, um, you know, whatever server you have, and um, it should take you right to the pages. And then you can just like the pages um, and ask to join the group. Right. Oh, okay. Um, and then another question is, do you know how public access to committee hearings and floor sessions may change this year due to the pandemic? And what tips do you have for advocates to stay in touch with lawmakers with the unique situation this year? Yes, I would say if you have a specific issue and you know that that legislator is involved on those committees, stay in touch with them. Um, we did try to um, amend the rules to make it a requirement that the committee schedules would be published with the bills ahead of time. And unfortunately, we weren't successful in doing that. Um, I believe in being transparent to the, the public so that you know what's coming. Um, but anyway, they should still be, um, they should still be available on, um, you know, they'll still be videotaped from the Senate side and they should still be on audio from the, um, from the House side. They are going to have some chairs and they're going to have a monitor out in the in the Capitol and outside of each of the House and Senate. I'm not sure how they're going to decide who, how many people get in and who gets those chairs, but they are, I think they're going to be very careful this year with the pandemic about um, who gets in the building. If you don't have a business, business with one of us and have an appointment, you're probably not going to get in. Um, so at, that, at least that's what we've been told. So I would say stay in touch electronically, um, be sure that you're listening, that you're monitoring, and then um, go ahead and stay in touch with your legislatures, your legislators, to let them know that you're interested, what bills you're interested in, what you're watching, so that um, they know. It, from my perspective, I try to be aware of those issues with my community. For instance, I stay really in touch with our local superintendent of schools. Okay. Um, um, are we ready? Uh, no, you can finish your thought, please. Okay. Um, so I stay really in touch with folks that locally have issues going before the legislature this year so that I know what their interests are. And so I would, I would suggest that if there are folks listening that have specific areas of interest or specific piece of legislation that they want to see passed, get a legislature, legislator, let them know what you're thinking about and ask them to stay in touch with you as it goes through committee or it goes to the floor. Great. Thank you. And, and that's, <clears throat> Out of our minds and if we get any information in writing or can have websites or information that we can share with folks we will definitely be doing that as well um, and with that i want to um, introduce um, mr sean decker and uh, he is an educator at uh, central catholic high school in wheeling and he is with his social studies Let me make sure he is ready to go Are you there, Sean? I think his mic right, is just one good. second. Hi, I'm I'm here. We're trying to work out the uh, work out the uh, the bugs here. Uh, trying to figure out what we're doing. There you are. One second. Hi, how you doing? Doing well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Oh, no problem. 
I just have to do one thing uh, that I should have been ready for and I'm not. Uh, give me one second. Um, let's see here. Can I? All right. Can you get out now? Okay. I am sorry. Okay. All right, I'm sorry. Um, I may have to um, relay the question. Okay. For uh, my students. So I'm gonna put this up on the board here rather than, one second, I'm sorry. I was really all ready to go and then I messed up. That's okay. We're all learning to live through this, um, these new times where we have to yeah. We have to use technology so much more. Yeah. Let me get on here. Okay. Watch. Oh, all right. Well, let me see. Can anyone, can you get on there? Okay. If you can get on there, get on there. If not, I can relay questions. So I'm going to do it in a kind of strange way. Um, some of my students are going to be on there. Some are going to be looking at you like this. Okay. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, let me turn up the volume here. Okay. So um, hello. Hello. Hey, how are you? Uh, Delegate Zukov. Uh, this is uh, AP government. At U.S. government and politics, uh, okay. the, the CCH class of uh, 2021 uh, AP class. There's only seven of us. Okay. Well, I'm so excited that you joined us today. Yeah, it's nice to join you too. Um, so we had some questions. Um, are we able to? Some might be joining you. Some may may just be coming up here. Can okay. Be, you can join. Uh, we're going to get them on here. So. Okay. I, I, so I'll start with my question. And this, is a, this is a deep one. Uh, I contacted uh, my, my good friend, Mr. Fluherty, uh, yesterday when I knew I'd be on with you. Uh huh. And uh, he's, uh, I asked him, you know, what's going on down there in the legislature? And he said, it's all about the uh, income tax versus increased sales tax. Yes. So the idea of getting rid of the, the proposal. Can you explain that proposal exactly a little bit with a little more detail or do you know? Right. Well, the proposal is that the, the, um, the leadership of the House and the Senate and the governor have mentioned um, doing away with the West Virginia state income tax, mm -hmm. um, which is, sounds wonderful and good because nobody likes to pay extra taxes or pay any taxes, but we all like the services that those taxes provide. Um, and unfortunately, that is going to account for about that that tax accounts for about two billion dollars of a four billion dollar budget. So about half of the budget for the state of West Virginia is made up of the revenue from that tax. Um, to take that tax away, there is going to either have to be other taxes that come into play, thus the sales tax, perhaps, um, or um, also, you could raise your real estate taxes. Um, there are other ways that the tax revenue could be increased. So um, while that all sounds well and good, you have to remember that West Virginia is a pretty poor state and that we have to have a balanced budget. So if that revenue gets taken away, we have to have a way to increase the revenue from another taxing source to make up the difference. Um, so that's where we stand with that legislation. So what is the primary, and I'm going to hand it over to my kids, what is the primary or what is the most uh, popular idea among people who support getting rid of the income tax uh, as to how they are going to make up for that budget shortfall? Well, I haven't heard that yet. No. Um, I don't think that we've, um, we haven't got into session long enough to know where the revenue, what they think they're going to increase that revenue with. So um, unfortunately, that question has been left unanswered, but it's probably the biggest question of the session. I've heard a 10% sales tax. Well, I've, I've heard that too, but um, 
You know, you have to think about that. And then West Virginia also has very low real estate taxes um, compared to the states that surround us. And um, just I'll give you an example. I was doing a little bit of research last week on the, I think it's on the, um, it's about 5% or 0.50% on the actual real estate um, the value of the real estate. And in West Virginia, in Pennsylvania, it's 1.57. Um, mm-hmm. So it's, you know, almost, it's double, it triple, almost triple what we pay here. So you have to think about it in those terms. So we have to have the money, either that, or you completely cut a lot of services out. Um, so what services could we count, cut out in West Virginia? Um, we pretty bare bones with services as it is. Um, so, you know, what, what would we cut out there? Would it be, you know, DMV? Would it be, um, would it be DHHR where we take care of our children and our elderly and um, folks that need medical, medical assistance? Um, where would those cuts come from if we don't make up with it for a, rev- with re- a revenue source? So they're not talking a lot about that revenue source yet. Sean may know something I don't, but, um, but that's, that's where we stand. Okay. Um, is everybody on? Can everybody get on? Okay. Well, let's start with the with the folks who are who are on here already. Okay. So can I, I ask what? Can I make one more comment about the tax? Yes. When you talk about it being a sales tax, um, mm-hmm. that's pretty much a regressive tax because folks that are uh, you know that have to spend a lot of their money for um, food clothing, those type of things, it, it, it gets, food isn't taxed in West Virginia right now, but will that be a way to bring the revenue source back? It used to be taxed, but you know, it's a regressive tax because everyone has to meet those basic needs that we have. And so it's harder on the folks that have less income coming in than it is say for higher income brackets. Uh, so it's a little regressive tax that um, really hurts the the working people of West Virginia, if you think of it that way. So that would definitely not be something I would be in favor of. Okay. Well, I'm going to hand it over. Um, I'm not sure what uh, everyone's, what they've asked you already. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to hand it over. How about I see, uh, uh, well, Brandon, you have a question? You got your volume on there, buddy? Unmute yourself and, and ask. Young Hi, Brandon. Brandon. Do you have a question? Um, I really was just curious on what all topics you like look for when you're talking about like your D- DHHR, like how have you guys handled recently with everything going on with the virus? everything going on with the virus. Well, and I, I apologize. I always ask people not to talk in acronyms and that stands for Department of Health and Human Resources, which is like the um, Medicaid, foster care system, um, children and family issues. Uh, so it, it encompasses a lot of different areas. Um, and your question was how, what do they do? Is that what you're- Like how has it affected those? current thing like the what it oversees what it oversees well i think at this point from a revenue perspective um you know there's been money to deal with some of those issues but i'll give you an example um the folks that work at the state level in west virginia um dhhr workers don't make very much money and we have had a huge i i haven't seen the numbers because we haven't had an interim committee meeting all year so i'm not sure how to um what where we're at now but last legislative session we were shy 250 caseworkers in the department of health dhhr's foster care system so we um gave it raises and we also um gave additional revenue uh, to that budget so that those folks could be hired because we all realize what an important um, area that is. And we also in- gave an increase of revenue to foster families to encourage folks to become foster care parents. So that's one example. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, more. Yeah, stuff like that. Okay. Um. What would you say that you are most pass- passionate about fighting for? I'm most passionate like about fighting for 
for children um, in West Virginia. I feel that um, they can't take care of themselves and we have to have advocates in the legislature who care about them and who take their welfare and good well-being into consideration above all else. And um, that's one of the main reasons that I ran for the legislature two years ago and that I ran again last year. Can you guys hear me? To kind of go back to your earlier talking point of uh, raising the revenue through increasing sales tax, and was the alternative um, increasing income tax? Well, they're wanting to do away with West Virginia's income tax. So um, they need to come up with other additional revenue to make up the difference for that tax. So it could be real estate taxes that are increased. Um, and remember, these taxes help fund education, um, you know, fund education, fund the government agencies. Um, so we are required to fund many things, education being one of them. And if that revenue stream goes away, there has to be a way to bring additional revenue in um, to the state to continue to pay for those services that we provide to our residents. And as far as um, if you don't, because you described the um, sales tax increasing that as kind of as like regressive, have you right. considered a, like, what are the uh, legislature's thoughts right now on like a progressive tax system, like with tax brackets and a certain percentage for each income? And well, we have, yeah. we have something like that now, but that's certainly something that's been discussed that, um, you know, that we could go back and um, reassess our tax code and how we tax people. So that's certainly something that, that would be another way to bring in revenue, but I don't think that's quite the intent um, of the folks that are trying to, that are interested in eliminating the um, income tax in the state. And part of the reason that they want to do that is to draw more people into West Virginia, um, because they think if there isn't, that that's a hindrance, because a lot of states don't have, um, don't have income taxes, but a lot of, um, a lot of states don't have the poor economy that we have as well. So, you know, it's kind of a catch-22. Um, so I personally think that some of the things we should be doing um, instead of cutting revenue is thinking about how do we fund broadband in West Virginia? Because if we want to bring people to the state, um, I worked remotely for eight years from home when I wasn't traveling, when I wasn't on the road. So I know that it can be done, but I live in this area and I had good internet service. Um, you could maybe, maybe let's, for instance, you make beautiful quilts and you live in the middle of a county that doesn't have internet access. So the only way you have to market your, yourself is maybe to hang them in your yard or to go to a local store where there aren't very many people. But if you have access to the internet, you know, think of Etsy, right? You guys, are you familiar with Etsy? where crafters, you know, go out and they, they have their own crafts and they can market. If you don't have access to the internet, you can't do any of those things, even to bring in small revenue for your family. So I think about, you know, increasing broadband across the state. And then there's interest in that. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I'm the only one that thinks that, but I think that that's more important at this point in time than say um, reducing or eliminating, or perhaps, you know, maybe we go to, um, if we're going to absolutely uh, want to eliminate the sales tax, then we need to think about it in steps and increments so that we're not harming um, the folks in West Virginia with the services that they may lose or just taxing them another way. Think about it as a, as a future citizen that is going to have to pay taxes, right? Do you want to pay a West Virginia um income tax or do you want your um, real estate taxes to go up? In the end, you're paying the same amount of money or you are paying for a sales tax. So in the end, you're paying the same taxes. They're just coming out of different streams of your income, right? So um, I'm not sold on this yet. I need would have to hear their plan. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Sorry if I went on too much, but it's a little complicated. Um, 
Have you had any struggles being taken seriously in an official capacity? And if so, uh, what helped you work through them? Do you mean as a female? Uh, uh, yeah, kind of like that, but just an overall okay. in general. Okay, I just wondered. Um, well, I have to tell you that I have um, had some executive positions in my lifetime. So um, I've been working in a man's world for a very long time. So I'm not easily intimidated or easily shoved off, if you will. Um, so, um, but that comes with experience. Uh, I think that um, I make a place at the table and I, I do my homework always so that I can be taken seriously. Um, and I will tell you ladies that as a female, I feel like things have changed quite a bit, but I feel like I've always had to work longer hours and work harder to be taken seriously. And I hope that that glass ceiling is breaking little by little so that when you get into the work world or you decide to go into the into politics and the legislature or the you know House of Representatives or the Senate Washington DC that it's going to be a little bit easier for you but um, things like being talked over in a meeting I always come back and ask my question again um, I'm not easily rattled and um, I try to stay very calm I don't um, get easily angered not that I'm not seething inside but I don't let it show on the outside um, and I think that helps people take me more seriously and perhaps that's not fair because I can tell you a lot of gentlemen who I work with in the legislature become very angry very quickly and we have to deal with that. But I think that um, sometimes there is a double standard and we just have to learn what's your personality type and how do you need to best work through your own, um, the way you communicate, um, the way you wanna be taken seriously. But I think always doing your homework and knowing the situation that you're going into or the issue that you're gonna talk about very well is critical to your success. Is that the kind of thing you were looking for? Uh, yes, ma'am, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hello. Um, so since you are a uh, Democrat in a, you know, majority Republican state, does that make your job any more difficult? It absolutely does. And um, this is a little pet peeve of mine right now. So um, good question. One of the things that's been really hard, I think that um, as a West Virginia Democrat, I am, I consider myself much different than, uh, say, a national Democrat. Um, some of the issues that were put out. I mean, I saw a lot of things this last year, especially on social media, from folks about making derogatory comments about Democrats and what they stood for, that have people that have known me all my life. I mean, I've lived in this community my, for most of my life since I was six years old. So, you know, I've lived here, I've worked here. Um, folks who, who supported me in the past wouldn't call me back to put a sign in their yard. Um, you know, so I think that a lot of what's happened from to the Democrat Party I don't believe in a lot of the things that um, are per, that are professed from the National Democratic Party. I don't consider myself an elitist who doesn't um, who doesn't understand the working person or that doesn't understand rural issues. Um, so I think we've gotten a bad rap from that perspective. But I also know who I am and what I believe in, and some of the basic. Um, items like social justice is really important to me, um, taking care of folks and their interest who can't afford to hire a lobbyist to come to West Virginia legislature and, um, and try to get it bills enacted. That's really important to me. So I'm not going to change from being a Democrat to being a Republican, because I don't think that would be fair to the people that are going to be voting for me. But um, it's definitely going to be difficult uh, this year. We have the, the Republicans in, the, in the, both the Senate and the West Virginia House have a super majority. That means they need us for nothing. They, before when we, last year when I was there, it was 41 to 59. They, a lot of things like to change rules, you have to have a two thirds vote in order to do that. We could change some of that because we, they needed us to go along with them to do some of the things that they wanted to do. They need us for nothing this year. Um, so it's going to be a difficult year. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any follow up questions to that? Hey, buddy. Do you have concerns about me being a Democrat? I'm not gonna be offended. Do you have any follow-up questions? 
and I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I think it's something we need to talk about more. Um, you know, so I personally like to be defined as the person I am versus the party that I belong to. Because I'm, I'm very much a moderate. I'm, I believe in personal responsibility. I believe in being physically responsible. I don't like to have programs that we don't need. I don't want to have excess spending. Um, I think you need to be responsible with those funds. I don't know that that's typically what people think of when they think of a national Democrat. So um, I honestly would encourage all of you to think beyond party when you vote and to get to know the person that's running and what they actually stand for. Thanks for that question. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, considering all of the committees and associations you're part of outside of the House of Delegates, which ones do you think influence you the most as a legislator? Probably I've been involved. I actually started the Marshall County Family Resource Network back when I was working in the community in the, um, in the mid 1990s. And they are a resource for children and families throughout the community in Marshall County. So that one is really important to me. Um, one of the things that uh, we hadn't talked about, I'm also, um, I'm a huge animal lover and I volunteer. I'm on the Marshall County Animal Rescue League. Um, and I, and I, um, I have four dogs and I foster dogs occasionally. Um, so that's important to me. Not that it does a lot of my work in the legislature, but children's issues. Um, I'm also involved in the childhood cancer awareness group in Marshall County. We have a lot of childhood cancer in our area. And so um, thinking about the, about children, about their education, about their quality of life is probably what drives me the most in the West Virginia legislature, because I know it's cliche, but children are our future. And so I think we owe it to them because, you know, you, you, you either hit the lottery or you don't with parents, right? Um, <laughs> and I'm not talking about rich or poor, but do your parents care about you? Do they take care of you? Or are you one of the 7,000 West Virginia children that are in foster care because somebody can't take care of you? So I think folks that can't speak for themselves need someone in the legislature to stand up and be their voice. And that's what drives me um, is what most important in my work. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, we'll go ahead. So kind of going back to what you said earlier about how um, being a West Virginia Democrat is different from being a national Democrat. Do mm -hmm. your opinions on issues like the Keystone Pipeline or coal production differ from the National Democratic Party opinion or do you have your own um set opinions towards that? I have my own set of opinions. Um, I think that people really need to do some research on the Keystone Pipeline and understand that it's very Canadian based. And um, it, while it is gonna have a pipeline through our country, um, understand what it's about. Uh, and it's bringing sludge oil, you know, that's gotta be refined through our country to go somewhere else. Now, I do think um, from the coal perspective, uh, we, I live in Marshall County. I don't know how many of you are Marshall County residents. I know a lot of our kids go to Central now that used to be at Bishop Donahue. Um, my, one of my daughters graduated from Bishop Donahue. So Central was our, um, our big opposition, but now I can be, you know, I love Central. But, <laughs> but I um, just say all that, that, um, you know, we are the number one coal producing county in the state of West Virginia. And we, that is the coal mine here and the, um, the subsidiary jobs that come from the coal mine are the number one, um, is the number one job, the number one uh, producer of jobs in our community. I would be remiss not to understand that and not to think that that's important. And I, while I think that clean energy is really important and I do believe in global warming, um, I think that we owe it to the people who live in West Virginia who have mined the coal for all these years and who have helped produce energy for the rest of the country. We need to, um, but I, th I think we need to be realistic. It's been phasing out of production since the 1960s. So we are producing less and less coal all the time, but I think there has to be a way to um, 
let our miners work this coal, the coal industry, why we still have coal here, because that's important to us. It's the same way with the gas and oil industry, but we need to, if we're going to do that, we need to phase out and we need to have a plan to phase out and to bring those, to bring good jobs into our state as that happens. So um, I think that my opinions are a lot different than what you would consider the national Democrat opinion um, around those issues. Any follow-up questions to that? Uh, yeah, um, I guess, can you hear me? I hope you can. Yeah. All right, good. So <laughs> um, you spe speaking of party, we, we you know, um, we talk about, we don't talk about parties much in this. We're, we're learning really uh, a pretty narrowly defined set of things, basics of government and structures. But a party is, an, is something uh, that comes up kind of uh, on, you know, some de facto current events day when we talk. How about could it not? I know. Yeah, I mean, obviously. And, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, we missed, we, we were not together for obviously some rather historical moments. Uh, yeah last year, but um, one thing I'm, I'm curious about when we talk about parties that I, 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 uh, um, I feel personally that I've been, I don't want to, I'm, I use this term kind of facetiously, but I feel like my own views, uh, even as an adult, I've allowed myself to get somewhat radicalized um, through my own, and I know why, I know why I'm doing it. I'm media bubbles and all this stuff like that. Right. Uh, at when it comes down to uh, the West Virginia legislature, I've had my interactions with a with a couple uh, interesting characters who serve in the legislature. Um, but um, do you? I'm wondering, people. There's been people in in the legislature who have been there for a long time, correct? Yes. Yes. Now, regardless of their party position, do you see them? radicalizing because there's in in the kind of the same not like serious you know the way i'm talking about where they're all of a sudden their views seem to be where 10 years ago they would have been like well we can you know that's a thing but now it's they're all in on on whatever their, uh, the national platform is whatever do you do you feel that and see that in the halls in the i do see that i see that a lot and um, I think it's, I think this last, I'm sorry, Murphy, Murph, sit down. Um, I think this, Murphy, you can see he listens well. Let me see if, Murph, stop it, Murphy. I'm going to let him out. Hold on just a second. <laughs> My apologies. Um, I do think that that's happened. Um, I think that, um, especially in West Virginia, because we have been so, um, our politics has changed pretty significantly. I think that people get, get tied into that. And I see a lot more reactionary. I'll give you an example. Um, I saw some things this last year. Uh, we have two delegates in, in the, um, two delegates in Marshall, in, in the fourth district. And um, the other person who actually won and ran, vote for one, just vote for the Republican because if you vote for the Democrat, you're hurting the Republican. Um, so you see a lot of that. And you also see, um, and I have a B rating from the NRA, so I need to clarify that. But I also th see things being pushed like from the NRA perspective. And I'll give you an example. Um, we had a campus carry bill several years ago um, where you could carry a gun on a college campus. And I believe in, you know, we're an open carry state. I have a concealed weapons permit myself, but I think that that's fine. But I don't think that freshmen in college, having been to college, um, the, the students didn't want it and the the schools didn't want it, and it was being pushed by um, gun advocate groups rather than the people who it was going to impact. And so I just use that as an example of how I think 
that it's been more radicalized and how those issues from a national perspective get pushed down. I mean, I am, I understand this, it's a heritage issue in West Virginia. Everybody hunts, you know, everybody likes guns. No one has, we don't have a lot of crime issues with guns here, but I think some of those things get pushed from a political perspective when they're saying, oh, all the Democrats want to do is take your guns. Couldn't be further from the truth, from my perspective anyway, or I think from our party's perspective, but I think some of those things get pushed. Um, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Um, and one more thing, um, and then we do have to, I think we got to get back. We have to finish something before the bell rings. Uh, so okay. I'm, I'm sorry to, um, what would you say is the best way because I think a lot of the radicalization or whatever you want to call it comes from the fact that I was talking to my cousin that everything seems to be national now when you're on social media, everything's national, right. everything from the national perspective. What would you say with the, with the kind of, well, with the issues that local news and media, uh, how would you recommend getting kind of the, the better local story since we, it's really hard to get, um, that's really hard from a national person because it, the national plays down so much. I'm a big fan of the BBC um, from a national perspective. Well, what about for, lo no, for local? For local, um, I think probably like NPR. Okay. Um, they really try to give you the topic and give you the news. You're and then like you kind of public. Public broadcasting, yeah, yes. Okay. Right, exactly. Um, I just think that it's more fair and concise. And I think you guys, I don't know if you've done any research, but check out Citizens United, you know, where there's big money in politics and it's been approved in the 2000s and that's allowed. And you need to remember, everyone needs to remember that what's said in politics, it doesn't have to be the truth. And most of the time, especially this last election on both sides, it wasn't. So how does a person who doesn't know that try to learn? And I think you need to deep, dig deep down. I mean, and, um, and I think that that's really important to do because, you know, and stay abreast of what's going on in the legislature. We have, you know, there's a, there's a journal that's put forth every year. Um, West Virginia does, West Virginia media has a um, West Virginia um, news station from five to five, five thirty to six. Um, like it's on channel seven locally, where they talk about statewide issues. Sometimes it's swayed, but for the most part, I think Mark Curtis does a pretty good job of giving both sides of an issue. Um, and, and I'd like to just put that out here. I know you guys have to leave, but um, you know, some of your folks live in my district. I would love to do another Zoom call with your class sometime. If you guys are listening or watching the legislature and there's something that you're interested in or you'd like to talk through, um, I'd be happy to meet with you on Zoom call and do that. Okay. Well, we'll keep in touch. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Uh-huh. All right. Say goodbye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Have a good day. Decker and your class. You have a good day, too. And we are at the top of the hour. So, Delegate Kukov, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate the work you do advocating for kids uh, at the state legislature. Thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed it. Great. Well, in a few minutes, we're going to post uh, in the comments a link to the legislator, uh, the West Virginia legislature website. Perfect. So you can get information about the dates on your calendar. Uh, on the calendar, legislative session begins February 10th, I believe. It does, yes. Great. And then um, hopefully people can sign up for, you know, to track polls of interest and get more acquainted with the website before session begins. And of course, tomorrow, we will upload this video on our YouTube channel uh, so you can share with folks who may not be able to get on Facebook. So uh, Perfect. And, and um, Maddie, if we had any questions that we didn't get to, if you want to forward those to me, I'd be happy to respond later. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye-bye.